Hello and welcome to Horror Court Trash Over, the show that discusses all the masterpieces and trash the pieces of genre cinema. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. And we're back with another Summer Screams episode. Yes, it's hotening up. Yes. The heat is on. It is. It is. And thankfully, we've still... An absolute, it's got to be a record for us. This year, we've still managed to stick to summer films. Yeah. No one's... There's no winter... Um, summer camp films or anything like that, like we usually get. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to think. Yes. No, no, we're doing yeah. good. We're doing good. It's yeah. all right to accept that. It's okay. <laughs> I'm not sure about this one. This is summer. This is definitely summer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Today we are <laughs> discussing... I wish these films would be clearer. I know. Just say, oh, it's summertime. They do go swimming in the lake and it's hot weather with sun shining. Yeah. But that also happened in Creep Show too. Yes, okay, it's a summer film. Accept it, it's a summer <laughs> okay, film. Okay, okay. Okay, now. Um, summer film? Today, summer. we are discussing what I believe to be a modern horror gem. A, uh, it's one of my favourite modern horror films. One that kind of does the same thing that Scream did, uh, but for the 2010s. And it is The Cabin in the Woods from 2011. Yeah, yeah, really, really good film. Yeah. Milestone in modern horror, I'd say. Yes, I suppose. Yeah. Obviously very meta, very sort of a, a dark comedy horror film. Yeah, every now it? and then a film comes along and it changes the way you look at horror. And as I said, Scream did that in the 90s. And I feel like this did that for the 2010s because it's very much a commentary on slasher films in the same way that Scream was. Uh, and the stereotypes and what audiences want from horror films. And it's interesting to look at that from the perspective of the time that it was made. But of course, this was made in 2009. Uh, so maybe I should say for the 2000s. But it wasn't released till 2011. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a very interesting film. Yeah, it's, you know, it's not reinventing the wheel. You know, it owes a lot to Scream. Yeah. And that meta horror. Um, but it does do it differently, and it's interesting, and it's a it's a fun film. Yeah. So it's written and directed by Drew Goddard, who is the writer and director of Bad Times at the Al Royale, and director of four episodes of The Good Place. Also the writer of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, A Alias, Cloverfield, Lost, Daredevil, Defenders, The Martian, and World War Z. Oh, so he's only done two films, and we enjoyed yeah. both. So yeah. let's hope he gets some more. Yeah, yeah, really enjoyed uh, the El Royale film. Bad, Bad times of the El Royale. Royale. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, much of his inspiration for this film came from his own upbringing in Los Alamos in New Mexico, a place filled with scientists and co-workers all going about their business and living seemingly routine and ordinary lives, even though they were building nuclear weapons that could potentially destroy the entire world. Yeah, so very timely with Oppenheimer. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Everyone's uh, mouths at the moment. Uh, and co-written by the piece of shit that is Joss Whedon, and we don't care about him, so fuck that guy. Just move on. And just to be clear, we do not support him whatsoever. This is definitely a case of separating the artist from the art and <clears throat> supporting everyone else that worked on this film because they deserve our support, even if he doesn't. Yeah, I, I think it, it is a big conversation to have and uh, probably now's not the right time. Um, but yeah, I, I don't feel like Joss Whedon, his work on this film warrants us talking about enough, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, fuck it. Let's focus on what we love about the film, which is, you know, the people and, and mm -hmm. everything else. Yeah, Drew Goddard yeah. and and said piece of shit uh, wrote the screenplay for themselves after both coming off failed film projects. They locked themselves up in a hotel room in order to challenge themselves and wrote it in one weekend. Wow. After the film was shelved due to the studio's bankruptcy, even the filmmakers had a little faith in it until Lionsgate saw the finished film, uh, loved it and picked it up for release. Yeah. Did it do well? It did very well. It was made on a $30 million budget and it made $70 million at the box office. Nice. But this is also post-Thor Chris Hemsworth. That is, yeah. So that could very interesting. have had yeah. an effect. We have got... So and of course, Joss Whedon Avengers. 
Oh, of course, yeah. yes. So, we have got some more to say about Chris Hemsworth coming up. Mm. Um, but this was also uh, a film that received a lawsuit. Oh. Because Peter Gallagher, on April 13th, 2015, uh, he filed the lawsuit against the makers of the film and claimed that due to the similarities between the film and his 2006 novel, The Little White Trip at Night in the Pines, Joss Whedon and Drew Goddard had used his work without permission. The lawsuit demanded $10 million in damages. Whedon and Goddard uh, were named as defendants along with the production company Mutant Enemy Productions and distributor Lionsgate. And the case was dismissed 12 months later. Okay. Uh, I haven't read no, the novel. No, I've not read it. So... But yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really know what to say because no, no. having read the novel, this is all news to me. Yeah, but I think, yeah, I mean, the fact that it was dismissed, maybe. Yeah, I think trying to look an Evil Dead version of what Scream started. Yeah, I don't think that's really the newest idea. It's true. I mean, if that's exactly what he's going for in his novel, then he's definitely taking it from somewhere else himself. It's so <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's difficult with these sort of things. Let's talk about who's in it, because th this is a big one. Yeah, in a section uh, called... Oh, oh, in a section we like to call, Hey, I know you. Do you know your words? Are you I okay? Don't, I don't. I, I'm struggling today. It, it is... It's summer... It's we hot. are summer screaming. It's right humid. <laughs> I'm struggling. I'm sorry, guys. It's... I need a dip in a lake or something. It's... I'm melting here, so yeah. uh, apologies if I mix up my words a little bit. I don't cope well with the heat. Uh, so Kristen Connolly plays uh, Dana Polk, our final girl. Kristen starred in Revolutionary Roads, Deep Water, The Happening. <laughs> Lucky her. Confessions of a Shopaholic, Mona Lisa Smile. I can't wait to... You know what that one is. My I know the smile. name. Know the Julia name. Roberts. And uh, yeah, lots of other things. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if we're anything The else. Bay. I've, she was in The Bay. She the in Blumhouse The Bay. Film. I've, I've never seen The Happening. We need that's, to do a podcast the... episode on it. We are doing one Shyamalan film this month, but I, I don't feel it'll be the last. We have Jesse Williams as Holden McRae. Yeah. And he was in The Butler, or Lee Daniels, The Butler. Sisterhood of the Travelling Pants 2, and uh, Random Acts of Violence, and Jacob's Ladder remake. Okay, and of course Chris Hemsworth is Kurt Vaughan, and during production, MGM saw the dailies of a scene where Chris Hemsworth instructs his friends on the basis of his performance, and that's when they signed him on for Red Dawn. Two days later, that's when he was chosen to play four. Both Red Dawn and The Cabin in the Woods would eventually be delayed for several years when MGM went bankrupt and released a year after four. So this is very much, I think we were saying uh, recently on an episode where we haven't really had a modern film actor that started out in a horror film, but this is it. This is definitely one. Yeah. And what was he in? Um, what was Chris Hemsworth in? Everything. He was in a lot of things. Um, obviously, most known as Thor in the MCU films. He had a big cock in Vacation. Yeah, he was in Vacation, Mission in uh, Mission in Black, uh, Men in Black, the uh, International. Yeah, yeah, the one that no <laughs> one, I guess the one Mission, that no one likes. Mission International. Oh Mission my god, I, I, I'm, I do apologize. I am. I thought you were going to say Mission Impossible. I was going to say what? I am <laughs> struggling here. He's been in a load of shit. We he all has. know. We all know what he's been in. That's perfectly fine. Anna Hutchinson as Jules Loden. Yes, so she was in Wendy Wu, Homecoming Warrior. Yeah, which is uh, definitely on my watch list. Definitely. That's the uh, Brenda Strong film, isn't it? Uh -huh. the Disney. Um, she was in Sugar Mountain, Power Rangers Jungle Fury, Into the Jungle, and A Firehouse Christmas. Ooh, that so sounds like our sure sort of thing. It's definitely on our watch list. <laughs> she was also in Wrecker, Death Truck. Okay. Which looks very interesting <laughs> indeed. Um, we also have Richard Jenkins as yep. Richard Citizen. Now, Richard Jenkins... Gary Citizen. Oh, did I call him Richard you Citizen? Did. <laughs> he was in There's Something About Mary, Cheaper by the Dozen, 
uh, Bone Tomahawk, Eat, Pray, Love, Shape of Water, 2008 comedy classic, Step Brothers. It's not a comedy classic. He was in Nightmare Alley, Spotlight, Kajillion, yeah, Witches of Eastwick, The Man Who Wasn't There. Yes, very prominent actor. Yeah. Fran Kranz plays Marty Mikowski. Yeah, and he was in Donnie Darko. I do not remember him in Donnie Darko. No, I don't actually. I'm assuming random, random bit part. School kid two. Uh, it was a training day, The Village, mm-hmm. Hitch, Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Yeah. Um, Roderick Rules. I never watched. Did you ever watch I, them? I watched the first two. Did fine. you? So yeah. are they all right? Matchstick Men, Orange County. And uh, he was directed uh, Mass. Oh. The uh, Martha Plimpton film about the uh, mass shooting. Yeah. The parents that come together. I really, really want to watch that. Bradley Whitford plays Steve Hadley. Yeah, and he was in Get Out. Mm -hmm. He was in Tick, Tick, Boom, Godzilla, The Post, Scent of a Woman, Philadelphia, Saving Mr. Banks... Billy Madison and lots of uh, lots of others. Another, you know, prolific actor. Yeah, and finally, in a role that was originally meant for both Jamie Lee Curtis or Bruce Campbell. Oh, it's Sigourney Weaver as the director. Yeah, so Sigourney Weaver. Um, don't know much about her. Mm. Um, she was in Finding Dory. Um, she was in Annie Hall. At Avatar. Okay, let's let's do justice to our sister. <laughs> what was she in? Uh, she was, of course, in Alien, Aliens, Ghostbusters, Gorillas in the Mist, Gorillas in the Mist, The Village, Galaxy Quest. Um, one of my favorite films, Working Girl. One of Gary's favorite films, Heartbreakers. Yeah, the list goes on and on. It's Legend yeah. Queen. She is yeah. The moment that she appeared in that film, I mean, I was in the closet at the time, so I couldn't react too much. She was like, oh, that's cool, that's cool. But inside, I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Was it the moment she appeared or when you first heard her voice? Or did you think... I didn't click. Oh, that kind of sounds like I, no, Sigourney I Weaver. I did not click. When I first heard her voice, um, and I probably wouldn't have in Finding Dory if all of her dialogue didn't start with, hello, I'm Sigourney Weaver. Duh. Um, But, yeah... Massive highlight of this film, but talking speaking of when I first watched you first watched this when I showed you, didn't you? Yeah, I already knew Sigourney was going to be in it. Yeah. yeah, so when I watched this, I didn't know where the film was going. I, oh, I cause see. All the marketing really hid the whole idea of the film. It looked mm-hmm. like a, a standard Cabin in the Woods slasher film. Yeah, that's that's all it looked like. So when it opens the way it does, I, I honestly thought that perhaps. I had gone into the wrong film or something had happened, something's gone wrong. Mm. Um, and I genuinely, at first, I, I did not know how I felt about it because it was so weird. It just wasn't nowhere near what I was expecting. Mm. Um, but now I love it. And yeah, it was just, it was a great experience watching the cinema because it was just very, very surprising. Kind of like Malignant. Yeah. That, I suppose that is the difference between you and me in terms, in, in regards to this film. I knew what was going to happen yeah. uh, pretty much um, before I even watched the film. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have that <gasps> moment Yeah, because I, I knew it was coming. So, I, you know, obviously we're going to get into the film, but you have a different perspective of watching it yeah. completely blind to the twists and the turns mm-hmm. and such. So, yeah, and I do think that does have an effect on the enjoyment of a film. Yeah. Knowing you know, what's going to happen. Um, I mean, it doesn't always... I mean, it doesn't spoil a film, necessarily. No. You know, we all knew Janet Lee was going to die in yeah. Psycho, mm-hmm. but Psycho is still a masterpiece. Yeah. So, but it does... I think it does have an effect. So, let's talk about our feature presentation. Systems online. Acquiring targets. Get this party started! <laughs> What do you think's down there? Why don't we find out? Somebody sent those things here to get us. What do you want? 
What is this place? The cabin in the woods. Read it R. In theaters April 13th. We get opening credits of old Egyptian drawings and blurred over a black background before we quickly cut to an underground laboratory where engineers Gary Citizen and Steve Hadley discuss a mysterious ritual after a similar operation in Stockholm just ended in failure. Uh, again, an opening that was made with a deliberate attempt to confuse the audience and make them think they've walked into the wrong film, which it very much works. Yeah, it plays on our expectations of what a horror film does, where we have the opening kill. Yeah. You know, what, we are, what we're expecting from a film called Cabin in the Woods, with the marketing that a film called Cabin in the Woods had, mm -hmm. is we would open with, you know, a murder. Yeah. But something scary, something something happening, mm -hmm. not two guys in like what? It's not an office building, but they're kind of dressed for the office. Yeah, it does look like you know, I don't know what the place is called in the office, but it's that kind of energy, mm -hmm. you know. And they're going around on one of those. Is, is it a golf cart? Yeah, looks like a golf sort cart. of thing. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, and then after a while, they're just they're literally just talking shit. And at this point, you know, you don't really look into what they're saying but i mean obviously it makes sense in the bigger picture of the film uh and then it just randomly cuts to the title card of a scream the cabin in the woods and that's when you know oh shit we, we are in the right film and what the fuck is going on <laughs> yeah yeah it, it's it's confusing and it, it's a good way because it yeah. is playing on your expectations and the whole film kind of plays on those expectations yeah. of what we believe a horror film to be mm -hmm. or you know the stereotypes of horror yeah so american college students dana polk jules Loudon, court vaughn at uh, kurt vaughn Alden mccray and martin mckowski are spending the weekend at kurt's cousin's kurt's cousin's cabin while wow, that was a challenge hey. in the forest dana looks in a sketchbook at a drawing of a professor who dumped her via email yes Jules has dyed her hair blonde and is disgusted to find books in Dana's work bag in bag for the trip. And Kurt walks into the room and he uh, asks, her, asks her what she's doing with those books. So who gave you these? Who taught you about these? And she answered, I learned them from you, okay? I learned them from you. Which is actually taken from a anti-drug PSA from 1987. Yeah. Um, for a UK audience, confusing. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't really know what. We all know I've fallen and I can't get up. Yeah. Um. But that one, not so familiar with. So I was like, no. "What are they doing?" He then throws a football to Holden from the window, and Marty arrives smoking a coffee flask bong and reassures everyone that it's okay because stat statistically, police are less likely to pull over a guy with a gigantic bong. Yeah. So, yeah, so we have our established characters. Well, kind of, but, but not really. So, um, you know, Dana is the good girl. Yeah. She takes her school books with her at the weekend. Mm -hmm. But she's also getting over an affair with her professor. Yeah. Um, Jules, she's the more outgoing one. She's got newly dyed blonde hair. But she's also silly. Yeah. Um, Kurt is the conventionally attractive jock. Who also happens to have brains. Yeah. Because he's suggesting to Dana about what book she should take or, or what book she mm -hmm. should read next. Holden is the conventionally attractive friend of Kurt, mm -hmm. who's going to be a perfect potential love match for Dana to help her get over her professor. Uh, Marty is the slightly less, and I emphasize slightly, ever so slightly less <laughs> conventionally attractive one who loves pot and conspiracy theories. And wearing layers. He looks like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. He, it's what he's giving. Based the character on him. Um, but yeah, it's interesting what you said there, because immediately our brains go to, these are the stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And actually, there are certain things that take away from those stereotypes, but they slowly change as the film goes on. But because of our perspective of horror films, we immediately assume they are those stereotypes. Yeah, I mean... Even if they aren't fully there yet. Marty is... Marty uh, I feel is, like uh, yeah. Marty, Marty is the stereotype yeah. from start to finish. From start to finish. So he's the one, and it plays into the film, but yeah. he's the only one whose personality doesn't actually change. So he's always wearing too many layers. Like, he's literally wearing a t-shirt, yeah. a hoodie, and a cardigan. Well, funny enough, 
Um, that adds to the character, but there is a reason for there that. There is a reason later on. Isn't yeah, there? there is. Ooh, um, suspense, guys. The thermal coffee mug and bong was a fully functional mug and bong as portrayed in the film. Uh, it cost $5,000 to make. Yeah, I, I, I struggle with the character of Marty because I, I just... I mean, smoking pot is his personality. Yeah. And, I mean, that kind of grates a little bit with me. Do you know oh, what I mean? No, do you not think he's likable? I don't. Until I don't know. the final five minutes. I actually minutes. don't think he's likable. Oh, I, no. I genuinely don't. And I mean, <laughs> that's a shame, really. But I just, I kind of think he's. Just... And he has these weird conspiracy theories. And he does. They're have kind of true. Theories. I'm not going to lie. They are yeah. kind of true by the end. It, it is quite funny that he has all these conspiracy theories that conveniently happen to be true with the situation they're in. Uh, he does tell them uh, on their journey to the cabin how society needs to crumble and start again. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, they stop off at a gas station uh, where the attendant, Mordecai, tells them all about the Buckner place. Uh, he says he's been at the gas station since the war. And uh, Jules says, which war? He's like, you know damn well which war. <laughs> the delivery of that line always cracks me up. And he, he calls her a whore and uh, warns them that they may not come back from their trip. So he's very much your... Don't go to this place. You need to go back, kind of guy at a gas station stereotype. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's oh my god, what's his name from Friday the Thirteenth? Crazy Ralph. Crazy Ralph. Yeah. It's it's giving Crazy Ralph, definitely. Um, yeah, Mordecai unfortunately not killed. No, yeah, I would have, a cheap kill would have been funny, but obviously that's yeah. not part of the plot. As they drive up to the cabin, an eagle flies into a big invisible screen. Yes. More confusion. More confusion. Yeah. Um, and I always remember this was in the trailer, but it still never clicks with me that any, something could be different here. But it's it's kind of like, okay, wh- why is this there? But you don't really look too much into it. But that's the only thing included in the trailer that could lead you to think mm. it's not all what it seems. Yeah. Um, they reach the cabin, which has very much been designed based on the Evil Dead cabin. And Dana and Holden realise there's a one-sided mirror in between their rooms covered with a graphic painting uh, of people being murdered (laughs) and animals being killed. (laughs) Pretty much. Uh, He stops her from getting undressed after debating Pervin on her for a minute or so and offers to switch rooms. Such a gentleman. Yes. Eventually. Eventually. After he he does reluctantly inform Dana that uh, she's about to uh, show herself. Uh, but it works both ways as she debates Pervin on him for a minute or so when he's getting <laughs> yeah. undressed and puts the painting back up. He does go into the room and get undressed straight he away. He does. I think like, he wanted to see I that. think definitely. Definitely. Uh, from the lab, Citizen and Hadley remotely control the cabin and manipulate the students by intoxicating them with mind-altering drugs. Jules, their drug him via a hair dye. Yeah, so it's suggested that this is all being set up a little bit even before they get to the cabin. Mm -hmm. Because she's dyed her hair. In her hair dye, there's these drugs that have been put in. And it seems to be for each of them, the mind-altering drugs have been applied um, in preparation. Yeah. And you kind of... You know they've been followed from the get go because when they leave uh, the student accommodation, there is like a secret agent type guy on the roof watching, watching them. them. Yeah, so there's little snippets yeah. about oh, you know what what is all this about? Yeah, um, Citizen and Hadley get a call from Mordecai where he says the lambs have passed through the grate. They have come to the killing floor. Their blind eyes see nothing of the horrors to come. Their ears have stopped. They are fools. They are food for the gods. Cleanse them of their sins, and everyone's just laughing at him. <laughs> he's on speakerphone. Yeah, he's um, long-winded. Taking it very seriously. Taking it very seriously. <laughs> uh, everyone at the cabin goes for a swim in the lake, whilst everyone in the underground lab, other than security guard Truman, who doesn't agree with the idea, places their bets on the outcome of their game, the evil that will rise, and who it will kill. Now, during this lake scene, you might notice that Marty is still fully clothed on the dock. Yes. That uh, was because Fran, 
Hans, who plays him, um, is actually in good, if not better shape, than the other male students. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, if uh, they said in the uh, audio commentary that he's ripped like muscular Jesus, and that if he was shown being that fit, it would ruin the character. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this does make me laugh. It It's such a weird... And when it comes to acting, it's so strange that as actors, they felt that they had to be in a certain shape. Always. Yeah. Always mm -hmm. in a certain shape. And and it, it, it it's, it's another sort of discussion, maybe for another day, because it would take a while. But the idea of what you see on screen isn't actually real, yeah, or true. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of what is available to these yeah. actors, yeah, you know, and you know they don't do their nine to five. Mm -hmm. They don't have to fit it in. You know, they have trainers, and I I don't think he had a trainer at that point because I don't think he was a well known name. But someone like Chris Hemsworth, yeah. You know, later on, when he is playing for, you know, the guy who played Superman, whose name I can't Henry remember. Cavill. Henry Cavill. You know, th they have said, well, you know, it's our job to look like this. Yeah. We don't want to yeah. tell people that everybody has to look like mm -hmm. this. There's a very specific reason. This is part of our job to look like this. Yeah. Um, so I, I understand. But I, I think it's just, it's funny to me that the actor felt he had to be in that potentially be in that shape mm -hmm. just in case <laughs> yeah and it's i mean i'm glad he got the role as well because he is perfect casting for that mm, role yeah like he he really nails that persona um and yeah and could it could have been a good shaggy in scooby-doo he could have well we already got the perfect shaggy in scooby -Doo. the party is in full swing at the cabin they start to play Truth or Dare when Marty dares Jules to make out with the wolf head on the wall. Um, she accepts. She's a business by Iggy Pop starts to play and she proper goes for it. Like the walk up to the wolf, the way she talks to it, when she starts kissing it, it is a slay. Um, it is. It's very weird. It's weird, but I it's was very absolutely weird. slayed by it. <laughs> Uh, the wolf's tongue is covered in powdered sugar to give it a dusty look and to make it more tolerable for Anna Hutchinson. And it's not a real taxidermied it's wolf not, head. It's not, no, no. Um, because apparently there is laws against that, yeah. which is understandable. Yeah. It'd be very strange. It would be very strange. Uh, so, <laughs> even stranger. Um, yeah. But yeah. at, at this point, she's starting to act more like her stereotype. Yes. Now. Um, she's constantly sexy dancing. Yes. And... Yeah, um, but I mean, I'm I'm here for it. I'm absolutely living for it. Um, Jules picks Dana for Truth or Dare, and uh, Kurt assumes she'll pick Truth because she's so boring. Um, so she says she'll pick Dare, and again, Kurt's becoming a little more arrogant now, mm. and Jules is painted out to be the boring one. Even though, like you said, she's just Dana. had an affair. Dana, even though, like you just said, she's just had an affair with her professor. Yeah. So So it's kind of like, you know, um what's her name? Nancy Thompson. Yeah. In the first Nightmare on Elm mm -hmm. Street, where she's a good girl and she yeah. won't go to bed with Johnny Depp. But then there's Nancy Thompson in Freddy's Revenge Nancy via the Thompson's diary. Journal. <laughs> her journal. <laughs> This is the difference here. Yeah. So now she's, she's more erotic... like Nancy Thompson in the first yeah. film. <laughs> the erotic writer, Nancy Thompson. Yeah. Yeah. If you flip through the pages of a professor, they're all nudes after yeah. that one. We might uh, have some trivia coming up regarding Nancy Thompson a little later on. Oh. Uh, the cellar door bursts open, just like in Evil Dead, <gasps> and uh, Jules dares Dana to go down there. So she does, on her own. And discovers various artifacts, one of which is a painting which makes her jump and scream. So everyone comes rushing down. Um, Kurt suggests that she takes the top off for giving up on the dare, and she ignores him. Yeah. Again, not the Kurt we met. At the not start the, of the Kurt film. that we met at the start of the film. No. Uh, they start to investigate, 
and mess around with the artifacts. Marty constantly tells them to leave it alone and go back upstairs, but they don't listen to him. They're like they're in some sort of trance. So Jules attempts to put on a necklace. Kurt starts to solve a puzzle box that is slightly reminiscent of the Lament configuration. Marty looks at some film reels on the wall and Holden holds opens a music box. Dana interrupts them all and starts reading from the diary of Anna Patience Buckner, a cabin resident abused by her sadistic family. She recites uh, incantations from the diary and inadvert inadvertently summons the zombified Bruckner family and the maintenance team win the bet. Yes, Marty says, okay, I'm drawing a line in the fucking sand here. Do not read the Latin. And she reads the Latin. She does. And the maintenance win, the betting pool. Yeah. Amongst the possible other choices on the facility's betting board are the following. Werewolf, alien beasts, mutants, wraiths, zombies, reptilious, clowns, witches, sexy witches, demons, hell lord, <laughs> angry molesting tree from Evil Dead, <laughs> giant snakes, deadites from Evil Dead, mummy, the bride, I've seen the bride of Frankenstein, the scarecrow folk, snowman, dragon bat, vampires, Dismemberment Goblins, Sugar Plum Fairy, Merman, The Reanimated, Unicorn, Huron, Sasquatch, Wendigo, Yeti, Dolls, Zombie Regnet Torture Family, which is what they got. The Doctors, Zamb uh, Zambi, I'm, I'm going back. Jack o' Lantern, Giant, Twins, and Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> which I assume is, we need to talk about Kevin. No. Oh no, this would have been made before that, yeah? Yeah, of course. Oh, oh so it, oh yeah, I do remember. I think it's Kevin from Sin City, Elijah Wood's cannibal. No. Character. No? No. Well, who is it then? It's Kevin McAllister. Get, shut up. What? He booby traps the house. <clears throat> well, yeah. Joe Pesci should have been dead in that film. That's true. I, I mean, I, I'm not the first one to say it, but they, those two should have been dead. That could, could easily have been Kevin McAllister. Yeah. Could've they been... send him in for paint cans. <laughs> That'd work. Do you not think? Yeah. Who do you wish it was? Kevin. 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 Why, who do you wish it was? I was kind of hoping for sexy witches, to be honest. Sexy but witches would have been, been yeah. Sexy witches would have been great. Um, I love that they have the tree and the deadites from Evil Dead on there. They're clearly the biggest influence behind this film. E, the controversial tree. The controversial um, tree. Evil Dead. Listen to our episodes yeah. where we speak about the controversial tree. Um, but yeah, I think it's such a good idea to have that board there and it's really cool. And It's funny. I'm glad someone's made the list available online because there's so many times I've watched this film and tried to see all yeah. of the uh, options. Truman questions if everyone should be okay with all of this as they are. Um, and Hadley is disappointed that it wasn't a merman that they summoned as he's always wanted to see one. A fantastic mm. joke that will come back that later will on. will come back. Uh, we see on the screens in the lab that a ghost is currently attacking school kids in Kyoto. Nice little bit of J-horror thrown in there. Yes, Indiana. absolutely. Um, yeah. My favourite part. <laughs> so these uh, school kids, these nine-year-old girls, are being hounded by this <laughs> ghost in uh, Kyoto. And yeah. that that'll come back later too. Uh, Marty asks Dana if she also thinks something weird is going on because Jules and Kurt uh, are acting like stereotypes rather than their true selves and he suggests they're puppeteers and not who they are. Holden starts reading the Latin parts in the journal and has a flirt with Dana. Yes, yeah. Yeah, he can suddenly speak Latin. Yeah. Oh, and he's wearing glasses now he as is, well. Yeah. He's, found, he's found a pair of glasses somewhere. Hadley uh, releases pheromones, uh, pheromones in to induce Kurt and Jules to have sex outside. Uh, they also turn the temperature up when Jules says uh, she's too cold and turns on romantic moonlight when she says it's too dark. And uh, yeah, Hadley says, OK, let's see some boobies. And uh, Citizen's like, show us the goods. And he explains to Truman that it's not for them. Uh, and it's what their customer wants to see. It wants the, it's what the audience wants to see. Which is, I mean, true for a certain audience outside of this film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's playing... Oh, there's an old computer game that I cannot remember the name of. But you had to, like, set up 
booby traps. Yeah. In in the in the the house, and it's a bit like that. Mm-hmm. Like to try and this was to try and save them, yeah. rather than kill them. But it's a bit like, and you had to sort of go on CCTV mm-hmm. and find. I cannot for the life of me remember what it's called. Um, I think it's called Night Trap, mm-hmm. actually. Um, and it's a bit like that. So yeah. they're kind of setting up, but it's almost like they're making their own film. Yeah. And they're like, oh, okay, so release the pheromones. Turn up the heat, mm-hmm. you know, do this, that and the other to create this story yeah. arc, which I find quite funny because obviously, you know, that's what people do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, someone yeah. is directing a film, you know, and they're saying, yeah, maybe we need tits in this shot. Yeah. You know, maybe we need more boobs. And the director is obviously, spoiler alert, Sigourney Weaver. Yeah. Yeah, she wants to see it. Who wants she wants to, to see, see it. goods Because that's what the audience wants. <laughs> um, Drew Goddard was actually really uncomfortable directing this scene because of his Catholic upbringing. Okay. Um, but uh, Anna Hutchinson uh, was purely professional and actually comforted him by suggesting that taking a top off was no big deal at all. That is so unusual on this podcast to have trivia like that. Yeah. <laughs> usually, it's the, uh, usually it's the case of directors pressuring people and doing nude scenes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes sense to the film. It, yeah, it's it's gratuitous, and the idea is that it's commenting on films that are gratuitous. Yeah. So it's yeah, and at the end of the day, you know, this is what we want it to be: no big deal, and the actresses to be comfortable with yeah. it. And she was so yeah. two thumbs up. They're attacked by zombies, and Jules is decapitated whilst Kurt escapes, and this. Scene is <laughs> what? What is this Catholic upbringing? I know, yeah. Say about that. <laughs> no problem about murder. no problem yeah. with decapitation. Oh, <laughs> but Lord forbid there's boobies. Oh no, <laughs> not breasts. <laughs> <laughs> Can we set up uh, cutting a red off now? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm way more comfortable with that. Jesus is fine with that. <laughs> okay. No. Um, it's a. Very well shot scene. I love the shot of um, the saw that decapitates her going past her eyes. It, it's definitely very reminiscent of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm. Um, yeah, I just think it's it's the cinematography and everything in the scene is great. And uh, it's a film with tons of practical effects. Yes. Which is great to see in a film released in 2011. Uh-huh. Are made in twenty made in 2009. 2009. Even more, even more rare. Um, yeah, no, it's really, really cool. The and the effects are really cool and really well done as well. Yeah, which I fully appreciate. And once Jaws is decapitated, Hadley pulls a switch which drains her blood into a stone sculpture. Yeah, again, like what's going on here? Yeah. Marty is reading Little Nemo to help him calm down, and hears a voice telling him to go for a walk. He tells the voices that he's on to them before going for a walk. <laughs> he uh, walks past Dana and Holden as they're making out and informs Holden that he's got a husband bulge. A uh, throwback to the uh, journal uh, where the uh, zombie girl talks about her dad having a husband bulge when he tortures his family. Oh. Oh, I didn't get that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, lovely. Uh, when he walks outside, zombie patience walks towards him uh, before Kurt shows up and tells him to run, knocking over zombie patience in the process and calling her a dead bitch. <laughs> a really good jump scare here when he arrives. Yeah. Because we see her slowly approaching from the background and then he just appears out of nowhere and makes him jump, which has made, made the audience jump in the process. Um, Dana attempts to leave, but comes face to face with the zombie Bruckner father when she opens the door, and in a really great scene, he just throws Jaws's head at her. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> Kurt says, um, <laughs> "Not not sure it entirely looks like Jaws." Uh, I, yes, I give him that, but yeah. you know, it, she is covered in blood, so <laughs> yeah. Kurt says, head, yeah. Kurt says they should all stick together. Citizen pours more gas into the cabin, and then Kurt says they should all split up. Yeah. Much to uh, Marty's confusion. Yeah, but Holden and Dana immediately agree with it. Yeah, so they all go into their separate rooms, don't they? They do. Marty discovers concealed surveillance equipment in his room, and he's like, 
oh my god, I'm on reality TV. My parents are going to think I'm such a burnout. <laughs> He's pulled through the window, stabbed in the back, and dragged off by zombie Judah Bruckner. Uh, and his blood is also sent further underground. So we think that's it. That's the end of Marty. Yes. We okay. then get a classic scene, don't we? We do. The uh, The lab workers learn that the right in Japan has also failed, meaning that the American right is humanity's last hope. Yeah. And we get the CCTV of the schoolgirls uh-huh. <laughs> defeating the ghost, turning the ghost into a frog, and saying the very famous gif, the evil is defeated. <laughs> Um, to which one of the guys I can't remember their names. A uh, citizen. He uh, he's like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> These nine-year-old girls. Yes. <laughs> Elsewhere in the world. How hard is it to kill a nine-year-old girl? <laughs> Elsewhere in the world, other um operations have failed, including King Kong, who has been killed. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. King Kong has been murdered whilst uh, oh, no. trying to destroy somewhere. Uh, holding it was and... beauty that killed the beast. Yeah, apparently. Holden and Dana end up in a, secu- in a secret room where the Buckner father tortured and killed his family. The father zombie attaches his uh, bear trap to a chain and, uh, well, no, he attaches his bear trap on a chain to mm. Holden's back. Yes. And tries dragging him up through the ceiling, but Dana saves him and kills the zombie. Good on her. Yeah. Good for Dana. So she's giving that final girl energy now. She is. Uh, Kurt, Holden and Dana attempt to escape in their RV but Citizen triggers a tunnel collapse to block them. Something that fails at first, and they nearly escape. Yeah. Kurt gives a big speech. A big speech. In his scene that got him his role in uh, Red Dawn and later Fall. Uh, gives Did a it big, really? Well, yeah, it gives it because this is so impressive, and it is a, <laughs> a fantastic scene. It's really... It's so funny. Yeah. He gives a big speech about how he's going to go and get help and save the day. He's the hero type, and he attempts to jump a ravine on his ravine. Mo- ravine on his motorbike, but crashes into a force field and falls to his death. <laughs> this, to me, is the highlight of the film. It was so funny, and then this this was a surprise to me. Yeah. Now I should have probably seen it come in, mm-hmm. but I was too wrapped up in the film and everything yeah. that was going on, um, because we did see the bird. Yeah. Um. So. After that rousing speech, Mm -hmm. the uh, I am Spartacus speech, (laughs) to see him just splat against the force field. Hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. It's even funnier now that we know it's Chris Hemsworth and what he's gone on to do since. Yeah. 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 It's for me the highlight of the film. So funny. Because this is a black comedy. It is. It it is. Holden and Dana then realise their experience is staged and controlled and that Marty was right. All along. Holden is killed by... Yeah. (laughs) Holden is killed by a zombie who stabs him in the throat as he's driving, sending the RV crashing into the lake. Uh, He gets a bit of a boring death. He does. Oh, Holden. It's it's a shame, really. Friday the 13th, part six, isn't it? Like, exactly Friday the 13th, part six. RV... A guy driving, stabbed through the neck. Yeah, but he wasn't the love interest for our virgin. No, that's true. They should have gotten a more that's exciting true. death, I feel. Um, yeah, the RV crashed into the lake and the lab employees, seeing that Dana was the only survivor, celebrate the success of the right. And they explain that the virgin sacrifice is optional as long as she suffers. Yes. And Hadley is surprised that he's actually rooting for yeah. her as well. Yeah. Uh, everyone in the lab parties whilst Roll With The Changes by REO Speedwagon plays. Um, all songs available on the Now That's What I Call Horror Culture I Shiver Spotify playlist. Yes. We haven't plugged it in a while. No, we haven't actually. Um, and some of the staff explained to Citizen that the tunnel almost remaining open for the RV to leave was a glitch from upstairs. Hadley gets a call on a red phone informing him there's another survivor. And it's revealed that Marty is still alive. Oh. And he saves Dana with none other than his coffee flask bong. Yeah. <laughs> um, comical, them celebrating with margaritas yeah. as she's getting beaten up uh-huh, in, the in the background on the big screens. <laughs> and it goes on for so long. Yeah. 
Which, again, is such a horror trope that we're here having a great time watching these horror films. Yeah. Whilst this character has been hunted down and, like, almost murdered. Get a Jade. Um, Marty takes Dana to a hidden elevator that he discovered. They descend into the lab and it is revealed um, what is underground. They discover a large collection of different monsters in cages, including a werewolf, a ghost... A ballerina with teeth to uh, teeth for face. That's the sugar plum fairy. Yeah, the sugar plum fairy. Uh, Did you just call me? The ghost is a uh, floating head monster that was actually played by the movie special effects makeup artist David Leroy Anderson, mm. who is also Heather Langenkamp, ah. Nancy Thompson's husband. Langenkamp also serves as one of the members, of, and she does serve as one of the members of the actual makeup crew that created the different nightmare creatures. Uh, amazing that Heather Langenkamp did the practical effects for this film. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, that is super... She's just an all-round she queen. She is super cool. You know? She is Nancy. Yeah. I am Nancy. And uh, finally, Fornicus, Lord <laughs> of Bondage and Pain, known as Howlord on the betting board, is revealed. And as he's revealed, the Howlraiser score plays. Yes. Come on, guys. How the fuck did you get away with this <laughs> very on the nose very on the nose um it is basically it's not pinhead because he has like saw blades yeah it is a cenobite it's a cenobite instead of cds yeah it's saw blades, it's saw blades. and he's holding it's a rounded uh not a cube is it yeah it's, it's the like... one from the cabin um yes it's... Like a circular limit configuration. Yes, that's what um, it's called. Amazing. I love that they included that and managed to get away with it. Um, so funny. And he looks great. The makeup effects look fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, better than some of the actual Cenobites in the uh, later Howlers yeah. films. <laughs> Dana correlates them with the objects in the cabin cellar and realises that the objects determine which monsters are released. So we almost had Fornicus... Taking everyone down. Yes. And then we find out that Marty's status as a bona fide pothead meant that he was, in a way, immune to the mind-altering drugs that yeah. they gave them. And uh-huh. that's, that's how he got away with it. That's how he got away with it. The camera zooms out and shows all the other monsters in cages. Such a great shot. It is, yeah. It's... Oh, it's a music video that it kind of looks like. Yeah. Is it? Um, Mel C and Brian Adams. It does look a bit like that. <laughs> When you're gone, thank you for ruining a great home. <laughs> or like, say my name, say. My name. <laughs> it is. It is given that. Um, it's hard, hard to disagree. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. We welcome to the horror court trash of a podcast. <laughs> Cheapening great scenes in horror films since 2019. Cheapening? How dare you? To. Everyone was one, sick of that Brian Adams song. Yeah, one time. classic song. <laughs> and one that got really overplayed. Um, a security guard tells them to get out of the elevator, but is attacked by a zombie arm. And they manage to get away. A very familiar sounding voice tells the two of them mm. that she understands what they're going through, but this is something that needs to happen for something that is bigger than them. And they are to be offered to the Ancient One. Yeah. Don't know recognise the voice. No. <laughs> um, my question is, how do the monsters and such know not to kill each other? I mean... Like, I feel like the giant snake would win. Yeah. Because I think their entire purpose is to kill other people. Yeah. I mean, that's what they're programmed for in this facility. Yeah, they only kill humans. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Cornered by security personnel, the pair release all the monsters, which just creates absolute chaos. Yeah. Um, we see various monsters from the betting board, including the werewolf, alien beasts, zombies, reptilians, clowns, demons, fornicus, angry molesting tree gets an appearance, <laughs> giant snake, deadite, scarecrow folk, the reanimated unicorn, the Sasquatch, Wendigo, Yeti, the doctors and the twins... Maybe even more. Those are just the ones I spotted. Yeah. Um, and it's so fucking good. It is just... Yeah. 
absolutely ridiculous how over the top it gets. It's and mayhem. Just so many great practical effects. And the digital effects don't look that bad either. Um, but the practical effects are really, really good. I mean, someone gets murdered by a unicorn and it is fucking graphic. It is. Um, the the clown gets to kill someone. The merman gets his big reveal to uh, follow on from that joke earlier on and murders Hadley. This is gruesome. Yeah. Because the, the blood spurts from the merman's... Uh-huh. From his back. Blowhole. Yeah. Um, great special effect. Uh-huh. And that, that was practical. So great special effect there. It, it's... When you see the marketing and how the film begins, mm. ignoring the, the office yeah. part, and where it ends up, it's yeah. crazy, yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh-huh. If you're expecting an Evil Dead rip-off and then you get to this, like, yeah. office building with all these creatures murdering, you know, it's yeah. like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was just expecting to see a bunch... Oh, my God, so, sorry for all the sirens today. Mm. Crime is high in Manchester. Crime is, on it's this, the heat. On this oh, my God, wow. It's bringing out the worst in people. <laughs> bringing out the worst in me, wow. so... Must be bringing out the what worst is, in others. What is going on? <laughs> Um. Anyway, uh, but yeah, no, I, I mean, like I said, I started watching thinking it was just going to be a slasher film. It was a standard slasher film. I did not expect to walk out of the cinema. I haven't seen all of this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, But it's one of the, I think this adds to the rewatch value of the film. Like, there's so much to go back and see. Mm. Every time you rewatch it, I always notice something a little new because you see it all on the monitors um, as well. So it's, yeah, it's really, really fantastic. And it all looks so good. Uh, thanks to Heaven Lang and Camp for her team. <laughs> what? <laughs> Heaven Lang and Camp and her team. <laughs> we love her, but let's be real. <laughs> it is! <laughs> yeah, Did I, I mean, lie? It's, uh, no. <laughs> it's true. Is it but... Heaven Lang and Camp and the team she works with? It's true, it's true. <laughs> Give a queen credit where she deserves it's it. because can't remember her husband's name. <laughs> that doesn't matter. <laughs> Dana accidentally stabs Citizen as he's trying to escape and he tells her to kill Marty as he's dying. Dana and Marty discover an ancient temple with all the uh, stone statues that we've seen earlier on in the film where they are confronted by the director. Of course, Sigourney Weaver fucking slaying in a fancy suit and black gloves. Yes. Don't like what's going on with her hair though. Wow. I'm not a fan. Not a fan, I'm sorry. Uh, she explains that the world, uh, worldwide ain't... Uh, she explains that worldwide annual rituals of human sacrifice are how to appease the ancient ones, a group of cruel subterranean entities. <laughs> yeah, I'm just... It's, it's we never get to see them. So just, we get to see part of one. Yeah, the, the, the big things that live below the ground. Each region has its own ritual. And the American ritual involves the sacrifice of five slasher film archetypes. The whore, Jules. The athlete, Kurt. The scholar, Holden. The fool, Marty. And the virgin, Dana. The order is uh, is arbitrary as... Uh, abritur- whatever. Arbitrary. Yeah, I'm just losing my words as well. <laughs> as long as the whore dies first and the virgin dies last or survives. The director urges Dana to kill Marty to complete the ritual, as all of her rituals failed that year. Um, and if she doesn't kill him, then the world will end. So, of course, you know, you think, no-brainer, let's kill Marty. Yeah. But no, at the very last minute, these characters become really selfish and unlikable. <laughs> it's just, I, it, it's to me, it's strange. And I, I don't know, you know, other people may see it in a different way. But Marty, there's the the standoff where she's like, do I shoot him or do I not? Um, And then she decides not to. And they end up killing Sigourney instead. Yeah. And then the world ends. Yeah. I mean, let's let's get to that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, But but this, but the point I'm making mm. is that why is this even a question? Yeah. Like, why is Marty not being like, okay, just kill me? Yeah. You know, just just yeah. kill me. He's going to die either way. Yeah, <laughs> we're all going to die either way. And it's like, you know, his parents seemingly are still alive. Yeah. His family, <laughs> the other people's family, he must care for Dana. 
yeah. as a friend. Just be like, okay, I sat- She cares enough for him to not kill him. Exactly. But just be like, okay, I need to... Or get Sigourney to do it. Yeah. You know? I, I, I'm pretty much gonna die anyway. I just... I, I mean, don't it understand leads, the logic. I, it leads to some <laughs> social commentary on the state of the world. Yeah. And but I who, think... Who is he to decide? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if the world deserves to end or not. Yeah. You know? Well, first, Dana is attacked by a werewolf. Yeah. Um, and the director attacks uh, Marty before zombie patience kills her with an axe to the head and Marty proceeds to kill all except Dana. I love the werewolf uh, in this film. Man in a suit, the way it needs to be done. Yes. Well, not always. <laughs> Why? We've seen some iffy men in suits. As werewolves? Yeah, of course. In what? Oh, um, oh, was that a werewolf? Oh, it may not have been a werewolf. Oh, I'm thinking Boggy Creek. Uh, no, that was not a werewolf. <laughs> let's, let's not insult werewolves here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what, what was American Werewolf in Paris? That was CGI. Was it all that CGI? Was, yes, that was definitely not anyone in a suit. Was it all CGI? Yes. Was it really? It's terrible. Oh, no. Uh, deciding that humanity is not worth saving, Dana and Marty share a joint. <laughs> the temple floor collapses and a giant hand emerges from the ground, destroying the facility and the cabin as the world ends. Honestly, I was gobsmacked when I first watched this. <laughs> yeah, it's a strong what? ending. Every, everyone dies. The whole world dies. Yes. Yeah. And I think, in a way, it makes sense with this bit of trivia I have, uh, where immediately after an early preview screening with fan Q&A, the first question Drew Goddard was asked was, will there be a sequel? <laughs> to which he responded, did you even see the ending to my movie? Yeah. <laughs> now, I think it's good that it kind of eliminates the possibility of a sequel. Yes. Because a film like this, you could easily run it to the ground and lose what made this so great if you did sequel after sequel after sequel. Sometimes it works. Scream, Evil Dead. But there's a chance it could have gone the other way and mm. you could have been having straight to VOD sequels by this point. Yeah, it's true. You know? But that is The Cabin in the Woods. Yeah, um, really enjoyable. If you are a horror film fan, you will get the references, you'll understand it all, um, and there's a lot to be enjoyed. Yeah. I, I don't see why people wouldn't, you know, if you are a horror fan and you like stuff like Scream and that meta and, and all that business, there's a lot to be enjoyed. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I really think it is one of the best modern horror films and uh, just the idea that it marketed itself as something so straightforward and mm. ended up being on such a big scale. I, I really love that so yeah. much. Yeah, definitely. Let's get to the awards. Biggest queen. I've gone with the obvious. Of course, it's the director. I mean, what she was saying, not just because she's Sigourney Weaver, what she was saying <laughs> was making sense. Yeah. Um, I went with the Japanese schoolgirls <laughs> that defeated the ghost. <laughs> also valid. <laughs> Biggest gasp. I just got the main plot reveal. Yeah, I suppose so. That's because, I mean, true. for me, when yeah. I didn't know what the film was about yes, going in. of course. Yeah, I went with Kurt's face plant. Yeah. Best dialogue. Uh, all of Chris Hemworth's hero speech before he dies. <laughs> the evil is defeated. <laughs> and that's camp. Of course, it's Jaws making out with the wolf. <laughs> that is very camp. Uh, I just put the Sigourney reveal. Just Sigourney <laughs> Weaver being revealed as the director <laughs> in what was meant to be a throwaway horror film. Yeah. Um, that's high camp. Ratings, I give it 10 Sigourney Weaver suit and gloves combos out of 10. I give it nine layers of clothing to hide a rocking bod out of 10. <laughs> Uh, masterpiece, trash to be trash or basic. I give it masterpiece. Yeah, I think it's yeah, it's teetering on masterpiece for me. Yeah, it's Very available good. on Sky Video on Demand, Sky DVD, Blu-ray, and 4K. And if you enjoyed this, I recommend checking out Screen Twenty Twenty Two because it's the next big horror film with satire and commentary on the genre release after this. Yes, um, I agree, uh, and I also went with Hatchet. The bloody over the top, yeah, that's... cabin in the woods vibes, yeah. 
Um, talk to us on social media. We are Horror Court Trash Over on Facebook and Instagram. Horror Court Trash on Twitter. And Horror Court Trash Over on TikTok. Ooh! Um, Gaz 92 on Letterboxd. Gazmo205 on Instagram. And GazChris92 on Twitter. And Chris Barker 823 on Instagram and Letterboxd. Uh, give us a rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, like a follow and everything else. And again, go follow us on TikTok. Ooh, <laughs> very modern. What modern girls? And next week, Summer Screams continues. But before next week, it continues this week as well. Because this is the first of two double episode weeks. This Friday, we have our first. Texas Chainsaw Massacre Day celebration episode, which we will be releasing on the 18th of August every year, making our way through this interesting franchise. Hmm. Yeah. Starting on Friday with a double bill of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 and Leatherface Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Ooh. Next week on Tuesday, we will be discussing the ghost of Drag Strip Hollow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> see how that one goes and next week on friday it's this month's original versus remake and for the first time in a while it's an original versus remake threesome Ooh. with dr moreau oh now that is gonna be interesting where we are talking about island of lost souls the 70s island of dr moreau and the infamous 90s yes so you'll be hearing our voices a lot yes over the next couple yes. of weeks so strap in yeah, we'll be back same Hold time. Hold on to your nickels, girls. <laughs> we'll be back same time, same place on Friday. Bye.